especially on YouTube, you're told over and over and over and over again to pick a niche, stay within that niche and build up your audience in that niche so that you just keep getting bigger and bigger in the space. And especially because YouTube is so mature at this point, it's hard to get views at first. If you don't feel like making a video on this topic, pick something that you do like and then, then go do it. Because especially on YouTube, like the best stuff is always going to arise like when you really follow your heart. However you're able to get those hours of work in on whatever thing it is, you, you gotta do that instead of just draining yourself on like, I am a, this channel, like I talk about Barbies, so I'm only gonna talk about Barbies or, or whatever it may be. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is powered by Z by HP, HP's high compute workstation grade line of products and solutions. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Greg Hogg. Greg was a statistics major from the University of Waterloo, turned YouTuber with a love for teaching and for machine learning and deep learning models. In this episode, we learn about Greg's experience with Waterloo's unique co-op structure and how he found himself at the intersection of education, of content, of data science and entrepreneurship. So Greg, thank you for coming on the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. I've obviously seen a lot of your incredible content on YouTube. We've talked a little bit offline and I'm excited for you to come on and share a little bit about your story, how you became an educator, a little bit about sort of your somewhat unique educational experience mm -hmm. and uh, just to have an overall fun chat here. Yeah, me too. I uh, I think that Ken's Nearest Neighbors is the best name for a podcast there is, so I'm excited. <laughs> Amazing. Well, unfortunately, I cannot take credit for it. I I crowdsource the name. I've I've mentioned this a couple times, but the wisdom of the crowds is pretty is pretty darn good. Yeah, it worked out this time. <laughs> yeah, it definitely did. And I always had veto power, so that that's true, always a, true. a benefit as well. Yeah. So. The way I usually start is I'm interested in how you first got involved in data. You know, was there a pivotal moment where you're like, wow, this domain is super interesting and I want to dive in? Or was it more of a slow progression over time where you sort of found your way in the data domain? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess I started programming, which is probably most people start into like really basic start into data um, and that was like in you know grade nine grade 10 simple programming courses um, I would make like more and more complex apps in like grade 12 um, and then I chose to go to Waterloo which we'll probably talk a fair amount about I'm guessing um, but uh, yeah just just to kind of talk in the middle like of university I guess like I I joined their their mathematics co-op program and I ended up switching or not switching, but choosing my major as statistics, which I guess is my real like obvious when it's kind of looking like a data path. Um, they actually have a data science major, although it's basically computer science, so I couldn't do that. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess I guess around maybe second year university when I uh, majored in statistics. Awesome. Was that a very just natural path for you? Or for example, when did you just like, how did you decide statistics was what you what you wanted to study or what you wanted to pursue? Yeah, so to be honest, um, when I joined, or, or when I was thinking about university in, in general, um, I have two older brothers, and they're very successful. They both went to Waterloo. Um, and I was basically just like, Hey, this, this seems like an obviously good pathway. There might be other pathways, um, that are good, but it seems good. Um, and to get into Waterloo's co-op in general, you know, they have a bunch of different options, but, um, mathematics is the one that I, I it, it's a little bit easier than computer science. And what was the actual question that you asked? <laughs> I started to think about other things. <laughs> no, 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 that, that, that was very sensical, but it, it was more just how did you decide on the statistics path uh, to go yeah. down that route? You were, you were actually quite yeah. on the right track of answering that question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. Um, so I think around second year, uh, the AI buzzword stuff started really, really popping up. Maybe it was already before, but I guess um, I was talking to all the people that were also getting interested in it. Um, and I didn't really think about uh, like 
getting into data science, like statistics and Excel and all of that sort of stuff, I sort of just jumped like right into um, the advanced artificial intelligence. Like I, I guess there was a couple books like in university that I picked up uh, like at the very beginning, but they were very old. Um, I jumped into the most recent material, which is like Andrew Ng's courses. um, And I just like really, really found it very interesting. I wasn't thinking about it as like, uh, this is a good way to get a job or anything about that. It just, I found the actual theory of it and what it was capable of doing very, very cool. So yeah, I, statistics as a major, I basically just chose because that followed that direction as best as possible um, in terms of the courses that I would be taking. It backed it up, um, but honestly, learned most of it on the side, um, at least more the more practical stuff on the side, for sure. That's cool. And so, I mean, it seems like your interest in deep learning or in some of these advanced concepts that just drove your study path. And I, th- I think that that's really neat. You're, you're able to follow something or, or like guide your education towards or is closely related to the things that you're interested in in real life. I think not everyone really finds what they're interested in early on, but it's also, you know, that takes some self-exploration, tinkering around uh, and things as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested. Can you explain how that co-op program works um, at Waterloo? That's something that's fundamentally different than what we have in the U.S. or probably more traditional education. I heard about something similar in France in one of my recent interviews, but I, I think that program is relatively novel for a lot of the audience. Yeah. Uh, So basically how it works is so from the applying in high school stage, it looks basically identical. You do have to say like kind of check a box that says you're going to apply to the co-op as well, Um, because for most but not all things, they have both a normal option and a co-op option. Um, I think right now or now the engineering stuff is all uh, you do have to do co-op for that. Uh, but especially definitely for math, which is the one that I was in, um, a lot of my peers were in the normal one as well. But uh, yeah, basically, once you are into the co-op section, um, you your first eight months or two terms look, or it depends on your schedule, but generally your first eight months or two terms is the same as everybody else. But in... Uh, Every time, like before, um, so it's it's four month sections where you do four months of school, four months of four months of school, and then the next four months would be a co op job. Um, so you have to apply to those jobs, and you would do that in the middle of the the previous or like at the time during study term, and that's really really difficult to do because. At, at basically all stages of it throughout the five years that it is. Because in, in your, for your very first job, you have no experience at all, most people. Like I had like a, a really silly job like in high school that has nothing to do with any of the stuff you would be applying to. Um, and you're actually you're fighting in the exact same pool as all of the experienced people. So generally, you know, it's going to be like most of most of the jobs um, are going to be obvious that the first year people will get they're kind of more simple um, or even something like Microsoft will be like, this is like a, a more junior job that will give to the younger people that are really worth it. Um, and so basically you, that application process is uh, I'm not going to talk about every technical aspect of it, but there's a couple rounds of it where you do a bunch of applying um you do obviously interviews interviews there are not like um not like full-time interviews where you do like sometimes four or five rounds for one job it's like basically you have one interview occasionally a second one um and there's some sort of ranking process to get a job um you do that throughout the the five years the the school school work, work, school, kind of whatever four months uh, arrangement that you wanted in. Um, 
and yeah, I could, I could talk later about kind of the more specific things that I did. Um, but that that's the process in general. Eventually, you get a job and you, you'll do four months of what looks basically like a full-time job, but it, it's usually not taken quite as seriously. Sometimes it is. So are all of those relationships cultivated through the school? Or for example, can I go out and say, oh, I want to work for four months at this company. I reach out to the company or see something online and, and post it. Also, do you get paid for the, for this type of work? Like, what mm. what is the dynamic there? Yeah. Uh, so the first question, it's very, very flexible, or the school is very flexible in terms of how you get your job. They do have um, possibly the best network uh, of their own connecting the school itself um, to, like, the entire world, basically. Like, people took... My friends took jobs in Japan and all over the U.S., most in Canada, it's mostly Canadian based, but there's a lot of US and other ones. Um, and you can definitely, uh, if you, if you yourself reached out to Google, um, or you like, maybe um, someone reached out to you on Google, or you applied to an internship role, however, you did it, as long as uh, both sides are well aware that it's an internship, and that you're going back to school, usually, like if you apply to a job, um, it'll like, like in an, an internship like job it'll have a checkbox that's making sure that you are going back to school at some point um as long as you find something like that then yeah the school's like go for it that that's great um the salary is i have had friends that don't get any salary so it is i don't think it's mandatory every time it's strongly strongly encouraged to have a salary um but I don't think it's mandatory to have one. Everything that I took had a salary and you can actually uh, go on their website for each different program that there is, uh, like mathematics, computer science is what they're best known for. Um, and then obviously there's a bunch of engineerings. Uh, you can check their website and for each program they have a table where it's like year one, the average salary is this. And th so they give like the three, three data points. It's like the average, the minimum and the maximum for the term. The minimum was always $14 an hour because that's our current minimum wage in that Canada. Um, and the maximum was about 50, which would have been like Google or something like that. <laughs> um, and you, usually pretty much everybody was on the average though, which uh, for mathematics, it was something like a little more than minimum wage for the first year, a little more in that second year. And then it ramped up at the end to about like 30, 35 Canadian per hour, which is quite good actually. It well pays for your education the next term over. So the school does pay for itself if you really do it right. It's pretty great. This episode is brought to you by Z by HP, HP's high compute workstation grade line of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions. And I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z4 workstation. I really love that Z workstations can come standard with Linux and they can be configured with the data science software stack. With the software stack, you can get right to work doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. And so, sorry, this is just super fascinating to me. So two more questions. I'll ask them sort of sequentially. So what happens if someone doesn't land a role? Or does that <laughs> never happen? No, that happens. Um, so basically, the school does have some statistics, that a bogus statistic, where it's like every single person gets a job or 99.99% .99 get a job there's some there's one of those asterisk situations where it's not really true um and people do um firstly take a long time sometimes um and sometimes not at all the school is does not it's kind of weird they don't like if you don't get a job but they also won't help you that much if you are trying to get one and they, of course, have their network and they have a team that's dedicated to doing that. Um, but to be honest, like you're you mostly just have to work tremendously hard and outwork the the other people that are in the same group, which are already very skilled. Um, 
But what happens if you don't uh, if you don't get one? Well, for so basically, if you're saying like you're you're studying, you're studying, you're applying as well, you're trying to get a job for the upcoming term, and then it hits the point where it's like your study term's over, um, and then it, you should be working, but you don't have a job. If you if you are in that point, uh, for the first couple of weeks, you can keep trying. Where even though your friends are working, um, you could actually just keep trying to get one, and you would just make less money overall and you would start a little bit later but nothing would change like for your academic uh, record or anything like that and then i for i think i forget what happens if you truly don't get one uh, but there are some academic consequences um there's some funny things you can do where it's like you randomly choose to work for yourself. It's like, hey, I have a startup now or something like that, just so that it doesn't mess with your record. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not a big fan of it if you don't. <laughs> I understand. And so you also, do you pay for the the four months where you're interning to the school? Or like, how does that work? Is, is that separate? Or are they, uh, you know, what does that look like? Um, like you mean, Sorry, so why? I, I assume for the four months you're in classes, you like pay the university for your education. And yep, then when yep. you're in the four months where you're doing the internship, do you also pay the university for facilitating oh, that in some okay. way? Because you're, okay, I guess yeah. you're kind of still in school, right? Yeah, yes, you do. You do pay, I think I distinctly remember a $760 fee, which is not nearly as much as tuition would be for a term, but something. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I'm not there anymore. And so I, while I talk mostly very positively about them, um, I'm open to some of the things that they can improve on, which is there's no reason to be charging what they do for that term. Um, of course, th there should be probably something, um, but they don't even like kind of communicate it well. It's It turns out to be something that's like a, um, so you actually, they just canceled it. Um, but for years and years and years in its history, you've had to do these work report things, um, where at the end of each work term, you have to write this massive report and the number of words varies and the number of words and form and format, uh, varies depending on the program. It's worse for engineering, or at least it was, um, but uh, you, have, you have to write these massive work reports about the things that you did. Um, and there's a bunch of like restrictions around what you have to do. It's not fun. And the, I'm talking about this probably because it's interesting, but also because the fee that I'm talking about, it, it comes out it, to be like this work report marking fee because they, they mark your report and give you a grade that doesn't matter as long as you pass. Um, but they mark it and make some massive fee for what someone probably just like read your report or nowadays quite genuinely an AI could read your report and assess it decently in no effort at all. So it's, it's kind of funny, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that seems super interesting. I mean, coming from U S education, I'm like, Oh, $750 free. That's like a, they charge us five grand for, for outsourcing our labor for the, for the summer, which I, I think is, is pretty comical, but I'm interested. Obviously, it seems like that that's quite a challenging cohort. But on the other side, it does give you more at, you know, work experience than pretty much anyone coming out of college. You know, people are griping about, oh, how do I get two years of experience when this is my first real job? And then I guess you guys are the reason why that 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 is that is a meme. But I'm interested in how you felt about that. I mean, do you think this is a, 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 a good program, a good experience? Is that something you would recommend? Or is that something you're like, oh, I probably could have been as successful without this going my, my own path? So it depends on, I would definitely say the program, because depending on where you go and who you talk to, the field of math in general can vary from you're just a nerd that's hopelessly doing theory for no reason to you could be working at Google the next day. Um, 
So at Waterloo in particular, they've strongly associated math with computer science, where to the point of quite genuinely, they're basically the same thing at the school. At least if you want math to be the same as computer science, you, you basically can. Um, if I, I don't think that same sort of understanding exists outside of the Waterloo co-op environment um like uh, many companies and the employers uh, understand the the waterloo people very well and so they know uh, or, or maybe they've been to waterloo and so they definitely know um but they know that like the math people are pretty much just as qualified sometimes more qualified than the computer science folks or engineering it all depends on you know the sides the stuff that you've done on the side um i think it's a f phenomenal program um but i don't know if other universities um like throughout the u.s or canada or wherever um would be able to implement the same sort of success for um it would be really tricky for math i think you probably could do it uh, for something that's very obviously applied like um computer science or computer engineering or any of those um, in terms of the difficulty aspect, it's, um, it's really hard. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not super smart. Like I, my IQ is right in the middle of that normal distribution. Um, and I, like I watched my peers do generally just grasp concepts better in courses. And I would have to work really, really, really hard um, j just to pass these courses and that's even ignoring like the co-op stuff, which is basically just, um, it feels like a massive headache at the time, like, because generally humans are forward, forward thinking where it's like the next four months, if you're trying to get a job to work, yeah, if you're trying to get a job to work for the next four months, you're generally thinking about that a lot more than you are than than the school stuff that you're currently doing, unless you have like an exam or something super important. Um, so I think that part makes it really, really difficult. And especially because there's such a, like a, I don't know if stigma is the right word, but like just a social aspect of the whole job thing where you know that if you could do something, could do something slightly different, like apply in this certain way, write this cover letter, um, like, reach out to people, do other stuff on the side, depending on what you do, the five years that you're spending at the university could be drastically different. Like you could get a job at Google the first term and the rest of it would be insane. Or, you know, if you maybe got to that at the end, that's what most people are hoping for, to be honest. Um, and so that whole aspect of like what your friends are up to when they get a job that's better than yours, it, it, it does... It does hurt and it mostly hurt people that like I, i'm not saying that i got crushed i don't think i did but um a lot of people it just really got caught up in the social thing so i was all over the place on that one i think it's difficult um both academically like even just waterloo ignoring the co-op the academic side is considered very hard um adding co-op to the mix is genuinely brutal you have to work very very hard um but i don't think that you, at least not in canada i i don't know the u.s stuff super well maybe you could chime in um but i can't think of a, a even close to a similar experience in canada that's going to get you that job experience um and i think especially if you were doing something as general and academic sounding as math that like you have to make it applied in some way. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I really, I think the model is beneficial in uh, quite a few ways. If depending on what your goals are, you know, if your goal is to work in a traditional job and move up the rankings as quickly as possible, you're getting essentially four more years of experience or, or you know, the equivalent of a full year of experience if we're looking you know, a, a year and a quarter of experience uh, in college compared to, you know, what someone else might get just in the summers or whatever it might be. Um, and it's also guided. There's a sort of 
pressure cooker competitive environment, which I think does breed high achievement, but also might not breed stability or or self actualization. And I think that those are things to consider. I mean, obviously, we'll we'll touch on this a little bit later, but that's not you know you didn't go down a traditional path towards uh, towards a more traditional engineering role. You went more of an entrepreneurial path. And I'm interested if, you know, you got enough of the traditional rat race in in that experience in school that you're like, I don't want to do that. I, I've learned that, you know, I've, I've had success there. I got my internships, I got my work, but there's other paths out there as well. Um, I think there's only, I know a couple people who went to Waterloo and I know like one of them is Joma Tech and he's obviously not doing a traditional uh, nine to five work these days. I, I wonder... I mean, it breeds successful people, but in what domain is is sort of uh, up in the air? Yo, have you watched Joma's recent videos, the tech news stuff he's been doing? A little bit, yeah. I haven't oh. seen the most recent one, but I saw the the one on the tech layoffs. Oh, okay. Yeah, his ChatGPT video is great. Yo, his like use of sarcasm and stuff or satire, so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's. Uh, I, I like his his sense of humor. Uh, very different oh, yeah. than mine, but it's also like I, I quite appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so yeah, did you want me to talk about the entrepreneurial path and stuff? Yeah, let's go down that route. Uh, a route. You know, how did how did you first get interested in that? Obviously, you've mentioned to me you're, you're doing YouTube full time and teaching. Uh, so I definitely want to understand a little bit of background there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you, you asked um, a couple of minutes ago, like if I was, I don't know, uh, yeah, let's go with sick of the, uh, the traditional kind of job lifestyle, at least I've had, had enough. Yeah, that, that's a good word. Um, and I, I've seen it just like everywhere um, is like my dad has done it, has done a traditional job for years and years. Um, I said, I have two older brothers, they have traditional jobs. And then again, yeah, in Waterloo, like I had a couple. And I certainly, by any means, do not want to like, just trash on the idea of a traditional job. I think they can do so much for just the very ma like vast amount of people. Obviously, not everybody can be entrepreneurs. Um, I mean, I guess maybe if they're all YouTubers, but not everyone could start a company for sure. Not that I have a, I don't really have one. Um, but anyways, I don't want this to come across as I'm trashing on the traditional approach. But I have seen people do it. I have done it a bit myself. And it's just boring. I think I think is really the way to say it. Um, like in in co-op, I did four months at one job, four months at another, eight months at another, and then again four months at two others. So I think five jobs probably, um, ranging from all different things like programming, data analysis, um, machine learning, and then at the last one I did some like state of the art deep learning stuff, which I thought was great. And if I was to do a job again, I would definitely do it in the advanced AI area. Um, but it's not about the work that uh, I'm doing. Like it, it, it's about the, the way that it's done and mostly just that how it's rewarded for being an employee in general is that I, what I don't like because I, and I guess that's kind of what Waterloo teaches you well is that you like you get out what you put in. Like if you work tremendously hard and you outwork everybody else, you will win greater than everybody else. And unless there's just a technique that I'm not seeing, it's hard in a full time role to work, 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 work and get more and more and more out of it. Like you generally will have the same salary, you probably, you, you will get a raise and a better raise if you work harder. Um, but that's generally on uh, a linear or especially in Canada, a rather logarithmic uh, model, where it's it 
kind of just tapers off where it's like you get seven thousand dollars extra this year which is like less than inflation or something like that um the way to get around that especially in the u.s would be to work for a massive company that can afford to pay you well um but for the majority of roles like they i don't feel like they like it's just that the model just doesn't really work to me um where i want to be on an like an exponential rate where you can do a bunch of stuff at the beginning probably see no progress um like if you look at my youtube channel you know most of the stuff at the beginning most of the stuff in general um has basically no reward but if you keep doing stuff you keep getting better and better um then you should be on an exponential rate of return and that's what i want out of it and also not only just the kind of success i don't like having a boss like i want to be the boss i want to i don't want to tell other people what to do i will i have had sort of semi-employees um like through upwork and stuff like that and i try my best to be the best boss that i can um so it's not that i i have a demand and urge to be at the top it's just that like i i don't like other people telling me what to do i feel like i should be in charge of my day-to-day like every single aspect like i don't want to go to bed one night thinking oh yeah i have a meeting tomorrow that i have to do i'd rather it's like i have a meeting tomorrow that i could cancel it if i wanted to if i want to sleep in you know yeah i i resonate with a lot of that i think there's limited upside with the more traditional work path and there's there's scales to that you know for example if you're working in a startup and you have some equity there's opportunity to grow with the company although the payout is delayed right you have to the company has to decide to sell or you have to sell shares or there there's constraints around that um and the amount that you know for example i make as a content creator it scales up directly with how much effort or or how good i am at my job it's not about consistency it's about essentially eating what you kill and getting the the complete reward for for what you do and i think for a lot of people or for some people that's very appealing for other people that's completely terrifying and and it's okay on both sides of the of the coin you know there's in theory a lot less day-to-day volatility in a more traditional job i won't say though that there isn't volatility in it over the long term you know you're looking at all the tech layoffs that we see right now i mean i i've always viewed it is that if i am responsible for my own income independent of the companies that i'm working for my income will essentially never go to zero I mean, there'll be months where I make less money, you know, I might make a ton of money one month and make very little the next month, but I have the tools and I have the infrastructure to essentially make it so that I never have zero money coming in. If I'm working at a job and I lose my job, yes, I might get severance, but after that runs out, there is a point where in theory, I can have nothing coming in. And that is something that's even more scary to me. Uh, because you know, if, if you, uh, I've probably said this a couple times before, but I, I'm a big believer that if you understand how to make money, if you understand the skill of generating income, you see it all over the place and you can capitalize on it. Like I look at entrepreneurship as like a muscle that you flex and you say, Oh, I see this opportunity. I either capitalize on it and I flex that muscle and work on it and grow it. Or I don't, and I, I work on some other att- attribute that I'm trying to do. Um, and that, to me, is one of the most freeing or like liberating feelings. Is like, oh, I, you know, it's not that there's unlimited money out there. Well, I mean, in theory, there is. There's like unlimited income that is unactualized. Um, but I feel like I have some sort of key to the matrix to be able to identify those opportunities now uh, that, I, that I didn't have when I was working more traditionally. Uh, and it, it took literally me making my first dollar online, which wasn't even from YouTube. I think I wrote a Medium article um, and I saw like, I was like, oh, I made a dollar on that article. This is this is amazing. Like in theory, if I scaled up writing Medium articles every day and sharing them, whatever, I could make a living, right? There, there's there's all these crazy things. You're like, oh, that that's an option that I didn't have before. Now 
I can do that. Yes, it would take a ton of work, but it's a like a spigot I can turn on if I need to turn it on. And and again, that feeling to me was unbelievably empowering, and it you know in some sense sort of changed my world. Um, did you have anything that that sort of inspired you like that in your entrepreneurial journey? I know we talked a little bit about Gary V and and some of his stuff. Uh, I'm I'm wondering you know where you draw your your philo- your entrepreneurial philosophy from. So I've been following Gary V and a couple other people, but mostly him, uh, since about the same time, actually, in second year that I was following the or learning the AI stuff. And that was mostly just because um, not from a business point of view or entrepreneurship, I kind of ignored his entrepreneurship stuff at first. Um, but he's a real like, like, just punch you like, go get it. Like, come on you can do this but he's not gonna be like hey you can do it like yay you good job or whatever it's like no like get your stuff done um and so i i I liked that uh kick in the pants and as i continue to follow him because he arguably puts out the most amount of content of anybody in the world if you look at him it's like four linkedin posts a day like five shorts a full length youtube video and he's been going for years and years like the man knows how to do it um he has to because that's what he says back to people is constantly make just keep making content um but uh yeah him in particular uh you know really really resonates and sticks with me because as i was getting into the um, so basically I, I haven't talked about like how I even started YouTube. Um, to be honest, as, as kind of everybody does, you just literally start YouTube, like you make a YouTube video and then suddenly you're a YouTuber. If you keep making videos, um, like my friend said to me recently, like I, I suggested he make to make a LinkedIn post on something. And he was like, I don't make LinkedIn posts. I'm like, well, you can start Not like you just attitude. make a link. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, um, but yeah, basically, my uh, one of my friends just told me that I was good at explaining things, and I've always like really tried to pride myself on like dumbing things down, following people's kind of like emotions and eye contact, and where they're following things and where people are getting lost. Because um, I've I've had some really smart friends from Waterloo that think that they're good teachers because they you know, know the concept well, um, and better than I do at times. Um, but most people have a real tough time of knowing when people get lost and how easily people get lost. Like in two seconds, like you can be explaining something and then they don't catch something. And then if you're still talking about something else, they, they lost you and they're not even listening. Um, and so I've really pride, tried to pride myself on, um, you know, teaching things in a way that people are going to get it. Uh, The best way to do that is through like a one-on-one class where you can actually follow them. Um, But YouTube has advanced metrics that let you know, like if people are still watching at every single second of the video, you can look at the graph, say 100% are watching at the beginning. Then by 30 seconds, you've already lost 70% of your audience. Maybe they maybe they can't hear you because you have a bad microphone that's honestly pretty common in youtube videos um or they just don't follow what you're saying or they don't trust you um and so it's a youtube is just so great for that where if you keep getting better at it and you keep trying um you will get rewarded and that exact same metric as it should be is what tells youtube whether or not they should tell people um or like promote the video to other people because of course if some people liked it um they can try and see if other people liked it if that keeps going they keep trying keeps getting better that's when it's exponential and stuff like mr beast videos end up hitting the whole world like every single video because he's a complete master of it um And so, yeah, I mean, basically, I don't know what I always just start going off on crazy tangents. I don't know what your original question was, if there was an original question. Um, Yeah, was there? (laughs) Yeah, no, So you you were you were still still spot on or at least loosely loosely related to the question, which was, you know, where where do you get your sort of entrepreneurial uh, spirit from? What inspired you there? Uh, and, And I think that there's a lot of 
kind of really interesting things in in what you described there is one with YouTube, the amount of feedback you get, the amount of control that you get. That to me was one of the most empowering things that that I could think of is, oh, I have metrics. I can see the direct response to the content that I, that I produce. And I think that YouTube is, uh, it, it's not a perfect one-to-one of, oh, I produce this really good content and I'm getting the return on it. Uh, unfortunately, the algorithms take into account your entire body of work and how the individual piece of content fits into that. I think maybe short shorts or, or those types of content, it, it's a little different where you can put something out there and it can, can really go off completely independent of your portfolio. Um, but that was something that really drew me to the platform early on as I could say, oh, I can quantify my success. I can quantify my growth. I can quantify all these things. And it's a really good mechanism for feedback. You can also ask people through polls or whatever it is. It's, it's a very data driven profession, even though it might seem like a creative profession or whatever it is, is that, oh, I made these changes in these videos. How is it impacting how many, how long people are watching? How is it impacting all sorts of different things uh, in that vein? Uh, I, I also am interested, I guess I sort of inverted the the order you did things in, you know, Gary Vee's approach where you're constantly putting out content. I found that to be unbelievably draining. Although at the same time, more recently, I've increased the amount of content that I produce by almost tenfold. Essentially, I'm doing that by paying other people to do it uh, or just cut the things that I produced into, into smaller clips and such. But I find that to be a really interesting avenue of, of, of growing on any platform. You know, I, I heard I love Alex Hormozzi. He's one of my favorite sort of like business influencers. And he said something that really, I, I don't know if it's surprising, but a light bulb went off. It's like, oh, if you produce 10x the content, you'll probably 10x your viewership. And I was like, well, you know, you're probably right. That's, that's crazy to think about. Um, you know, that's assuming all the content is high quality or of similar quality to the yeah. other one. And I think with outsourcing and and essentially being the boss, you can assure that. Uh, and that, that to me is, is, is a really cool thing. I, I am interested though, when you're self-guiding, uh, you know, as essentially entrepreneurs have to do, how do you avoid burnout? How do you avoid some of the negative consequences of a lot of the friction that, that you create when you are self-guided? So, and again, this is something that Gary V strongly agrees with. I guess I probably just, am just agreeing with him. Um, but quite generally, you have to allow yourself to be flexible in what you enjoy doing. Um, and so, uh, Burnout is a common term, and while I think it's more so just you start not liking stuff. Like I can, there, there's things I could work like a beast sometimes. Like you know, last year in particular, I've kind of slowed down a little bit this year because like I maybe I'm burnt out. <laughs> um, but uh, like last year, like I could work like a beast on things like you know all day like into the night um for like like weeks on end you know take taking breaks here and there but in general like working very hard um and i was liking what i was doing at, at the time and i i don't think you're gonna get burnt out just by working like you, you might but in usually it's because you just hit a point where it's like this isn't fun. Like, I don't feel like doing this today. Um, at least maybe I'm, I shouldn't be talking for everybody. I'm talking for me. Um, but for me, it's like, you know, some days I'll feel like writing like a long script where I'm just kind of going off and write, getting all my opinions out. This is great. Uh, that, that could take a couple of weeks, a couple of days, however long I could keep working on it and it would feel great. Uh, but then, you know, maybe took a break, a couple of days go by and then, writing a script might feel like the worst thing in the world to me, not necessarily because I, I'm just burnt out of it and I'm sick of that particular activity because I did it a lot because I just, I don't feel like doing that now. Maybe I feel like coding. And so I might do like a coding project for a while um, instead of making like a YouTube video it might pivot to something more like a, like a paid online course or like 
as you said earlier, like you, you see as an entrepreneur, it's not like you just, people think if, if you're not an entrepreneur or you don't see yourself as one, um, people think that you have to have this huge idea to be an entrepreneur where you have to like inf- like pitch to investors and build up all the money and stuff. But you don't, like, as you said, like you just see money, like sitting around at every corner, like this amount of money could take like this amount of hours. So maybe I won't do that, but I'll, I'll think about it later. Um, I don't know why I started talking about that. I go off on crazy things. Um, but yeah, burn burnout. Like you could sit there working on things for forever and ever if you enjoy doing it. And Gary V obviously likes what he's doing. Like by producing all of this content, he's got people for it. Um, you know, I can tell from the writing that he's the one writing his LinkedIn posts. Like it's not that that's not automated stuff. Um and I mean, all of this, most of his stuff is video based. And so you can see him talking and he's, he loves it. Other people, you know, maybe you, you watch him doing this and it's like, wow, that's so cool. And you love it for like a week and, and then you really don't. To avoid burnout and that type of thing, you just have to keep doing whatever you like doing. And, and I really fell into this, fell into this trap, I feel like especially on YouTube, you're told over and over and over and over again to pick a niche, stay within that niche and build up your audience in that niche so that you just keep getting bigger and bigger in the space. And especially because YouTube is so mature at this point, uh, still, it's still got ways to go, but it's, it's got a lot of people creating channels for it all the time. Um, it's hard to get views at first, not only because it's hard to make videos, but even if you made a good video with few subscribers, it's like, it's just hard right now. Um, so you have to like, if you don't feel like making a, a video on this topic, then pick something that you do like, and then, then go do it. Because especially on YouTube, like the best stuff is always going to arise. Like when you just, <laughs> you really follow your heart and what you, whatever, however, however you're able to get those hours of work in on whatever thing it is you, you got to do that instead of just draining yourself on like i am a this channel like i talk about barbies so i'm only going to talk about barbies or or whatever it may be yeah i i find that that's something i've i've realized myself as well a lot this year is that i have to make content i'm excited about you know, I, I love podcasting. I could talk for people all I could talk mm. with people all day. <laughs> and it, honestly, the past maybe six months, I haven't been super stoked about making more traditional YouTube videos. And that's okay. Right? I mean, there's there's other avenues of content that I can make as long as I feel like I'm doing something that pushes myself forward, pushes my brand forward. Um, then it then it doesn't necessarily matter where it comes from. Um, I can leverage and and make a huge backlog of podcast episodes which i've done now i think i recorded like 12 episodes in the last three weeks or two weeks which is which is a lot but it's fun it didn't really feel like work to me and then now i i made a video the other day and it was easy it was like oh well i'm enjoying this again i can do it there's there's less pressure i don't have to put pressure on myself to produce in specific deadlines you know there's a lot of there's a lot to be said about being consistent but we're not talking about consistent week to week. We're talking about consistent over the course of a year, two years to continue doing this. And I think that that's the more important piece of consistency. You know, our motivation, yep. our habits, all these things, they, they can fluctuate. Um, but we're probably looking at those things in two short time frames. Uh, and I think that that might be one of the things that causes burnout is we're really focused on, oh, I have to do this in this time period. And the time period that we've created is just too short to to do all that and to to reasonably accept that. If you're like, oh, I expand that one month to three months, I could probably do all those things in that period and be completely, you know, happy and and motivated to do all those things. But we've just time boxed ourselves when we don't really have to. Uh, and that causes, again, a lot of that, that friction that we described. Uh, something I've also been doing is I've worked really hard to outsource now the parts of the work that I don't enjoy that much. 
You know, I think yeah. video editing is fun. I don't think I'm a great video editor, but it takes a lot of time for me. And now I pay someone to do it. And I get way more return on my investment from paying them than I do from from doing it myself. You know, a video usually takes me maybe 10 hours to make. When I was editing it, now it maybe takes me three hours. And so if I think about it that way, I get, you know, uh, what did I say, 10 hours, like seven hours back. If I look at an hourly rate for me, which could be, you know, depending on a consulting project, let's say like, 250 bucks. It's a pretty good amount of money. You know, that's almost like $2,000 that I'm saving every week. I mean, granted, I don't ever, I'm, I'm not working that much <laughs> in those types of projects, but the opportunity cost of that time is 100% worth it to me all the time. And I get to do more things that I enjoy at, you know, whatever imaginary rate I make up for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, it's like, I always think of it as just like whatever it takes for me to stay on like, well, firstly, enjoy what you're doing is number one, absolutely. And I think people don't put nearly enough thought into it. It's like you have to like it. Um, and that's when I think full time jobs are perfect is when you do like your job. There's a lot of people that are actually really, really happy in, in the jobs that they do every day. Unfortunately, it's a lot of people aren't as well. Um, I also know plenty so, of miserable entrepreneurs. So. <laughs> and miserable entrepreneurs. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's when, well, I mean, I think Elon's probably a pretty miserable entrepreneur right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Regardless of success level, a lot of people yeah. are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it, for me, it's like whatever it takes to just stay on an exponential rate of return, I'll do. If it if I need to save money and I need to like edit a video instead of pay someone else to do it, then I'll probably do it myself if I'm able to afford it. Um, and you can outsource the, whatever work you can. You probably should. Um, but uh, I think that's actually like that's where um like you and i are, are a little bit different is that um i i have to think more about uh what i'm going to like outsource because you do stuff um outside of content creation as well whereas for me it's like truly a full-time thing and the only thing i think about uh, aside from fun activities is like how do i how do i maintain this so that i can be a full-time content creator or just be a, like a full-time entrepreneur doing whatever I want to do um, all the time. And it's not, I'm not trying to say that I'm extremely poor. It's that as an entrepreneur, you can, you can spend uh, whatever money, whatever amount of money you, that you want. Like you can eat, like quite genuinely, if you go on like Upwork and ask for a video editor, you could pay anything from $5 for some simple editing to $5,000 for something crazy. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I'm sure you do as well. I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest you don't think about budgeting. Um, but yeah, like I, I do most things myself. Like I, I, I still wear most of the hats, YouTube hat today, usually a Python hat. <laughs> um, yeah. well, I, I think that's all about the stage of the journey as well. I mean, for the first two years I was doing YouTube, I was doing everything. Hmm. And I hit a point where... I'm, I started to think about essentially five, 10 years from now and okay, well, do I want to be making YouTube videos then? I actually probably would like to, I, you know, I think that that's something interesting to me. Would I like to be doing a podcast then? Actually, yeah, I, I really enjoy talking to people. It's probably one of the highlights of my days when I do them or my weeks when I, when I only have a few. And I was like, well, what can I do to give myself the best opportunity to do that, you know? in this imaginary date in the future. If I was just thinking about it for this year, I would say, okay, well, I probably want to save more money. I want to maximize my income for this year. Um, and I would probably do more stuff myself. But if my focus is five years from now, the thing that gives me the best opportunities then is creating my brand now as, you know, growing it as big as possible, spending 
almost as much money as I make reinvesting into other forms of content, just putting it out there, whatever it is. And, you know, fortunately I have that money to spend right now, but I see myself getting like exponential returns on the investment that I make now because I already have a first mover advantage in a bunch of spaces. I've done over like I'm almost at 150 podcast episodes, like for someone Mm -hmm. to get to that many episodes, it takes a lot of time. You know, each is at least an hour. It's going to take them and you include basic editing, whatever it is, you know, 200 hours of time to, to get to that threshold. You talk about YouTube in terms of growing at that pace, like, you know, anyone can grow on YouTube overnight and, and create incredible content. But the social proof that I get through that, the the more I grow on any of these platforms, the more it's just going to snowball because I rise to the top of rankings. I, I do a lot of these things. So I'm thinking, okay, uh, in the next two, three years, if I'm really heavily investing, then that pays off even more. Um, but I don't think I would be able to do that if I didn't create the cash flow and the other systems that I had when I was doing it myself. And so it's sort of like, okay, there's a pivot point where I can do this. Do I want to do it? Do I want to maximize for five years? It's okay if I want to. If I want to maximize for two years or one year, that's also okay. But I have to keep in mind what the opportunity cost of that is. So I think, you know, we're both on probably pretty similar paths. I just, you know, have, you know, I started earlier. So I'm sort of more at a, uh, at that type of trajectory where I feel like I should be spending on it versus where you're like starting to hit that ascent where, you know, it probably doesn't make sense to you yet, but in the very near future it might. So it's one of those exciting things where we all are on our own journeys and I'm excited to, to see what, what yours has to, um, has to offer in the near future. Yeah. Back at you. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Greg, those are all the questions I had. Do you have, uh, how can people learn more about you? What are you working on? This is your time to, to plug anything you have going on. Okay. So we got, uh, we got some actually good YouTube videos coming up. I've produced so like hundreds of videos at this point where of course I love statistics and data science and all that stuff. Um, but it's it, it's 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 a small niche for anybody, any single person listening. I got some really cool stories uh, that are coming up. Um, I got one on Nvidia. Hint, hint. Um, and not what am I hinting? I'm not sure what I'm hinting. Um, and <laughs> uh, and the metaverse is two very fun videos that I put in hours of editing. Um, got all the music. It uh, going for the emotional effect. So stay tuned for uh, the Greg Hogg YouTube channel, which is mostly a data science niche if you look at the channel right now, but I'm, I'm pivoting a little bit to some cool stories. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing those. If any of them are out before the podcast is, I think this podcast will come out maybe four weeks from this this recording date. So mm-hmm. I like okay. what we, I'll, I'll record. I mean, I will include all of Greg's links, his new videos, etc in the description of this and in the podcast notes on all the main podcasting platforms. So thank you so much again, Greg. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that was awesome.